from sunny Austin, Texas, it's the Counselor Dynamite View, coming at you. Welcome to the Council Dynamite View, based in Austin, Texas. My name is Star Burgess, and joining me are my co-hosts, Crystal Kell and Jenna Fleming. We're so happy that you're joining us for this month's show. We're going to talk about the topic of ADHD, which is also Attention Deficit Disorder. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, sorry. And so when we start thinking about ADHD, some characteristics, well, there really are about three main characteristics of ADHD. And that would be inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. So basically kids act without thinking, they have trouble focusing, and they can't sit still for any long lengths of time. Is there anything else you guys want to add to that? Um, I was just going to say that um, underneath the umbrella of ADHD, you can have the hyperactive, or you can have the inattentive, or you can have the combined part. Mm -hmm. And that, so um, not all children will, will have that hyperactive piece necessarily. Um, I was just thinking that that would fit the definition and the definition too. Okay. Absolutely. Anything you want to add? And I'm surprised there's not the word frustrated in that definition <laughs> because that's typically what you hear with parents and teachers when they're trying to go through that maze of finding out what's, what exactly is going on and how to best serve their children. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds good. So I was actually looking at some statistics on ADHD, and I wanted to share with you guys a few of the statistics from the Center of Disease Control. Um, <clears throat> 9.5 children between the ages of 4 to 17, so our school-age children, 9.5 of them are diagnosed with ADHD. Um, as of 2007, that was reported. Um, boys are diagnosed at 13.5. 2% while girls are diagnosed at 5.6%. So wow. I know my experience has shown that to be true, um, boys having the higher number of um, diagnoses. Um, boys are 2.8 times more likely to take medication than girls, and parents of children with a history of ADHD report almost three times as many peer problems as those without a history of ADHD. Yeah. So it's those so three times as many. That's, yeah. That's interesting. That's oh, pretty yeah. significant. It's yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's certainly plaguing the schools a lot. I know we have uh, children who all the time seem to be having either the ADD or the ADHD being diagnosed. And um, if we start thinking about the characteristics, again, of ADHD, you know, again, going back to the inattention, hyperactivity, and then the impulsivity, and I know that you were had mentioned about there kind of being the hyperactivity mm -hmm. or the inattention, that kind of thing, making sure that the distinction is made. Yeah. So when we know about the characteristics of ADHD, what kind of things do we, and since you all are primarily in school, what kind of things are you like helping the teachers with? Or do you suggest for other counselors or even parents when they come in? And, and I think first we might add that you know, ADHD should be diagnosed by the child's doctor mm -hmm. or a psychologist has done testing yeah. first. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you get that paperwork that says the child has actually been diagnosed is, is of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what else do y'all? Well, that's what I was going to say. Starting there first is the conversation with the pediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, because it seems like Sometimes that diagnosis can just be a label. Sometimes other things can be done with that, like medication. And, and sometimes there are some things in the school set setting that can help, like there's something called Section 504 that can help some children that are diagnosed with that disorder. And basically, it's just um, accommodations in the classroom. And typically, those can be done with or without a Section 504 accommodation. And really what I have experienced personally is um, a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of changing, a lot of every single personality is vastly different than the other. Um, some of the go-tos have been 
a structured setting, mm -hmm. uh, minimize distractions in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, often preferential seating, which just basically means preferred seating for that child. It might be closer to the teacher or it might actually be a little bit further away from other children or other distractors for that child. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know about you, Crystal, but that's kind of where a lot of our starting points are, is just kind of starting with those basics and seeing what is a good fit for the kids. Yeah. Um, I would say I deal a lot with before they're diagnosed mm -hmm. um, at, at my campus and what do I do and not just from teachers but also from parents mm -hmm. um, having concerns. And so um, one of the things that I always try to make sure I say is that the symptoms of ADHD are very similar mm -hmm. to other things. And so mm -hmm. that, once again, stressing that, it's really important that you go to someone who works with ADHD a lot, mm -hmm. like a you know psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, you know, going to your pediatrician, having those conversations just to make sure. Um, but once we get a diagnosis of what's going on and what's happening, it then can help by looking in the classroom and seeing what changes can we make. And I think everything that you said is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I would add is sometimes having conversations with teachers about that impulsiveness and that mm -hmm. need to move. Um, because I think sometimes that's looked at, they're choosing to be naughty mm -hmm. and um, helping teachers to kind of wrap their head around it from a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily, I'm choosing to do that, I'm not thinking before I act. So mm -hmm. teaching them little cues like stop, you know, maybe rewind, let's look at this again, um, giving them lots of opportunity for movement, mm -hmm. um, those types of little things to help the kids out to be able to be more successful um, and learning to read themselves. I'm feeling antsy. Okay, I know I can get up and go get a drink. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. that's my body cue. And so the teacher has a sign for me, and I know if I do this. And those kind of built ins, I think, are helpful for the teacher mm -hmm. and for the student as well. I, like that. I think when I'm, from a private practice point of view, it's when I have parents who come in. Well, first of all, a lot of times they want me to diagnose, and I just nicely send them back or, you know, kind of send them back to their doctor. And once we get the diagnosis, um, then we're able to go from there. And a lot of times parents come to me about, you know, they don't understand it, mm -hmm. like, and they, so they need book resources or they, and they want, or they want me to talk to their child about, you know, how do we then take, how do we then, what do we do at home in terms of routine and structure and, and those kind of things. And so I'm finding that that's when parents come to me and they ask those kind of questions because I think they understand or they have a lot of support in the schools, mm -hmm. but then they're kind of lost about what to do when they get home Yeah, a lot of times. Well, I find it, like a lot of stuff I've read talks about it's your executive functioning mm -hmm. um, that you have difficulty with what 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 goes first what goes next and so I like the analogy that I came across once that was a person with ADHD has lots of filing cabinets open at the same time mm -hmm. and they go from drawer to drawer to drawer to drawer to drawer mm -hmm. and um, they leave the drawers open and they don't shut them and so their mind is mm -hmm. constantly going and constantly rolling around and I think that kind of sometimes will help parents <laughs> to get okay so that's why they didn't hear me say clean the room because they were busy thinking about the butterfly that just landed mm -hmm. on the window or you know <laughs> different things like that and so I think resources are awesome for parents there's a lot of great ones out there so so I like the what you said about when we talk about in the school setting the child up for success by helping to minimize the distractions giving them a task one task at a time giving them more breaks through the day perhaps mm -hmm. and um, keeping them I know sometimes I've even had where teachers or counselors or counselors suggested teachers to use timers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those things are it's another tool to help and that also can help at home so when we're talking about getting a task done having the eye contact with your child making sure that they're listening to you even maybe repeating, mm -hmm. what did you hear me say? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's and then, <laughs> and yeah, and then also, you know, maybe helping them with managing the time. Mm -hmm. So putting them on a timer. Yeah. And all of these, I like that you, you brought up, it's really a, a difficulty in their executive functioning mm -hmm. that really the children either it hasn't developed fully or it's developing in it in just a different way. And mm -hmm. I know um, I'm a parent myself, and so I understand frustration naturally. Mm -hmm. And it's it's difficult when we can't quite make our kids adapt what we want them to do or who we want mm -hmm. them to be. Or it, it can also be very heartbreaking to hear things aren't going as well as we had hoped they would at school mm -hmm. when we get reports from the teacher because sometimes parents don't see the behaviors as much at home, but they hear about it at school mm -hmm. because the demands and expectations are different. So really, I believe it's about giving kids 
tools, teaching them even mm -hmm. more curriculum mm -hmm. than what they're being assessed on at school or Absolutely. graded on on their report cards, but giving them more of that curriculum to help them be their best, to help them close a few of those filing cabinet drawers, you know, before opening up new ones. And so I love the idea of, we call them brain breaks, those activities for your body. Mm -hmm. And there are actually a growing number of resources online. I love like these games like we, mm -hmm. and, um, online, if even going on YouTube, we've, I've, um, if you Google brain break, just dance, mm -hmm. there are a lot of really cute little activities that just get kids moving. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've read a lot of research that makes that connection of the physical activity with the brain activity mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of giving them those tools and really in our minds as adults thinking we're teaching them. We can't expect something before it's been taught and practiced and practiced. It just takes a little while. And something else I like the idea of doing is really getting the teachers educated about ADHD mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times, you know, teachers have 20 or 23 or 25 kiddos in the classroom and they feel like they're already managing so much. Mm -hmm. And so then you're asking them on top of all that to be able to incorporate things for, you know, the, like the brain breaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how do you manage keeping everybody else on track as you're trying to also accommodate this child who needs those type of things? So I think education is so important, like when you're having your staff meetings, that maybe there's a staff meeting where you specifically talk about, you know, ADHD and what does that mean and, and how do you manage that in the classroom? Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think that that's important. I think sometimes it's um, also just the stress of how do I handle everything I'm supposed to be handling yes. and deal with this. And um, just kind of sometimes I can get teachers not knowing what else to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've, I've done this, I've done that. What else can I do? And they feel kind of like they've hit a brick wall. Yeah. And so I think that's an awesome idea is just at the beginning of the year, let's have a refresher. Mm -hmm. Let's see anybody else have some great feedback, like, you know, the, the brain, brain breaks. breaks. With yeah. the dance, that's awesome. And I've seen it used like in our PBCD classroom. That teacher's really good about pulling it out and using that. What does um, PBC stand for? Preschool but it's, program for children with disabilities. Okay. So okay. it's for okay. three and four year old children okay. in our school district. And so they probably would have some really good insider feedback for classroom teachers. Well, that's not just an ADHD thing, that's developmental. Yes. Yes. You know? yes. So the younger the kids, the more they're going to need movement. Mm -hmm. And so just using some of those same things and just kind of making it more. Um, acceptable mm -hmm. in an older classroom, mm -hmm. I think is kind of, but getting those ideas and tweaking them. We all love to move around. Yeah. Yes. And that's, you know, I, my current in, interaction with parents sometimes is that they hear these things from teachers and they're actually afraid to go to the pediatrician mm -hmm. with the concerns of attention or hyperactivity words being thrown in there because yeah. then they're going to medicate my child. Yeah. And that, of course, we know is not the case at all. Um, right. Nobody's going to put medicine in your child's mouth without you being a I've part of that, that decision. Um, but I do love that idea of let's all learn together. Mm -hmm. And so for teachers out there who are, okay, well, I need resources. I know your counselor dynamite at your school is an excellent resource. Um, and schools also have often, um, they might share them or there might be just one or two in the district, but diagnosticians that mm -hmm. specialize in um, looking at these, these areas, um, in schools yes. with children and sometimes there are LSSPs which are licensed school psychologists and they too can be a wealth mm -hmm. of resources and also your special education teams mm -hmm. on on campus can have a lot of great ideas like PPCD and mm -hmm. others and I think sometimes you just need something different mm -hmm. something to kind of change things up that's what I found mm -hmm. um, there's not really an answer mm -hmm. It's an effort. It's a continued effort and creative process is what I found. And I think also having a dialogue with your child about what does that mean? What, is, what does that mean to me? Is there something wrong or different with me because I've been diagnosed with ADHD? And I think kind of calming their fears. Is there something wrong with you? You just manage life differently. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to find ways to help you do that kind of in the positive way where in school where it's more structured and at home it might be a little bit more laid back mm -hmm. and so I think having that important conversation with the child and then um, you know helping so, them 
when parents come to you, do they ever have the concern of, do I talk to my child about this? Do I let them know? Yes, and, that, and oftentimes what's happened is the school counselors have done a really good job at helping children understand the concept that there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with you. And a lot of times, you know, I think that's a good thing because I think parents are caught up in the the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're close on it and it's very personal for them. And I think that once the school counselor knows, which is also a good point, having the communication once you get the diagnosis with your school counselor and your teachers. Because a lot of times when you're the school counselor, you're not really close up on the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so you can put it in a different way to a child and help them understand what's going on, what's what's going on with their body or the way of thinking that they have. When it, the, uh, for a child with ADHD, they have to learn mm -hmm. that there are certain cues their bodies are going to put out. And when their bodies put out those cues, what do I do for that? Right. And so I think that talking to your child, mm -hmm. letting your child know you're giving your child power mm -hmm. and um, you're giving your child wisdom to learn about themselves and how they function and how they work. Absolutely. And that's vital. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important. One of my biggest pet peeves is with medication when a parent says, this pill will make you behave or this pill's going to whatever. And so, um, because then children look at the pill as having the power. Mm -hmm. And um, for kids who do take medication for ADHD, yes, it, it can help and it does help. Mm -hmm. However, the child is still working really hard. Yes. And um, I, I, that's one of my big things is you have to empower your own child and make sure your child knows that no, honey bunny, you're doing it. That pill's just a helper. Mm -hmm. That you really look at what you're achieving. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important mm -hmm. that they do that and lift those the kids up. And the other thing I was going to say about communication is please communicate with your schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had situations where you have a kid who gets a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, they're doing really well. Once they um, have this diagnosis, things are put in place, maybe medication, maybe um, a plan, a 504, mm -hmm. something like that. They start doing better. Um, and then all of a sudden there's a big change. Um, we take them off medication, or maybe we have a teacher that's not following the plan, or we have a parent who says, oh, they don't need it, or doesn't share the plan. Because it's gotten better. Because they think it's gotten better. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you have a child who's failing, and um, that, to me, is, you know, and I've had parents say, well, you know, I didn't want my child to be labeled. Okay. <laughs> I understand that it's not going to go, like, in their permanent record. This isn't going to follow them forever, but you have to communicate. Because if I know that your child doesn't have that intervention, then we can look at other things to maybe try to help your child be successful. Right. And if I don't know, then I'm going to be thinking, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And we're going to be looking at, is this is yeah. a special ed issue? Is this a you behavioral know, issue? Is this a behavioral issue? Mm -hmm. You know, you start looking at other factors because you think that one's under control. Mm -hmm. And really, yeah, that's all that it is. It's just, let's tweak it. You know, let's play with this a little bit. I like that because I do think a lot of times parents, I like that you mentioned, you know, I don't want my child to be labeled or for this yeah. to go in their permanent record. Right. And I've seen, experienced so many parents acting on their own fears of the label yes. or the medication or what will they think of my child or this will go in their record. Mm -hmm. And often it's not even accurate information that they are working off of and making basing decisions yeah. off of. And so I think communication is absolutely key. I have never pressed a parent to put a child on medication ever. And I don't think any good counselor would. No. Um, it's unethical to do that. It's, it is. Yeah. It's unethical to do that. But I will advocate for children's best interests. And mm -hmm. so that may be looking at some other options that we could help to make that child successful that the parents are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, it does not go in their permanent record, as you said. And um, and so often, I know that parents, I have experienced my own self, um, parents trying to maybe, it feels a little like they're being sneaky, but I think they, it's all with good intention. Yeah. They want to see if we notice. Mm -hmm. We want to, they want to see if we notice them putting them on the medication or taking the child off the medication. And here's why I think that's really scary. Medication has side effects. Mm -hmm. yes. And we are we know we're there to look after those babies. Mm -hmm. And if we know that there has been a change in the family dynamics and the medication and the sleep patterns, whatever it is, we can keep our eye on some things mm -hmm. that we might need to be alert for. As well, we can keep more consistent communication with mm -hmm. parents so that they, in turn, can keep more consistent communication with their pediatrician. Mm -hmm. If medication needs to be adjusted, if that's the route that they're taking, 
little bodies develop very quickly mm -hmm. and they change mm -hmm. and medication is not a one size fit all. So um, I do, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's really, really vital, I mm -hmm. think, in the I school agree. setting. And they, and they want, they come to me and they're like, should I take my child off the medication? And mm -hmm. I'm just like, well, that's a decision for you and your doctor to make about your child. But there are lots of great options. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think that when you start building the team, which is you have your doctor and they're able to communicate with the counselor and the teacher. And if you get outside counseling, that everybody's a team and it's all for the betterment of your child. It's for their mm -hmm. well-being. Mm -hmm. Then I think that, you know, then the child benefits yeah. from that. And, and then if there is a history of ADHD, sometimes I find that parents aren't necessarily forthcoming also with that. You have to really almost probe a little bit. At least I find that mm -hmm. when I work with clients in my practice is that sometimes you have to probe. A lot of times they may not even put it on their paperwork. So you have to kind of get down to, well, let's talk about your own myths or misconceptions that you have about ADHD and your experience. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in a certain generation, they weren't t even talking about medication or how to get counseling for it. It was really, you know, either you're going to be heavily disciplined yeah. for not yes. paying attention at school, yes. or they thought you might need to be outside more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they put you outside all day so you can get all that energy out. I always had this school that thought you needed more <laughs> discipline. Uh, <laughs> and you get the one where yeah. it's like, let's go a little bit. Let's go a little bit. Do you need a spot? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank and, you. and you know what they said was is that well, I've heard people say that, you know, when my, um, when they instituted more discipline in the house, I got myself together. Mm -hmm. Like I behaved. Mm -hmm. I did better. It, and, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that it is but for today's generation. I will say this, though. What comes with discipline? Stronger boundaries. Mm -hmm. What do kids structure. with ADHD have difficulty with? The boundaries, the structure, mm -hmm. those types of things. So discipline, stronger discipline, you may see. Well, I don't think we're talking about the same discipline. I'm oh. thinking that these parents are talking about the spanking. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of the punitive, not the necessarily setting more structure okay. consistency. I think yeah. the parents that I've talked to in their generation, they've talked about getting more spankings okay. or, you know, the severity or the, the amount of spankings that they would get so that they would behave. Yeah. And I agree. I do. I, I agree with both of you yeah. that <laughs> firm boundaries, yes. clear expectations. And, you know, we actually did an episode earlier on that very thing. Mm -hmm. So you could mm -hmm. actually click back through our videos and um, and see the parenting styles. And see styles. the parenting styles yeah. one. That had some great tips on that. Um, but I agree. Sometimes they think, well, I'm going to go back to that old story I'm playing in my head about my own childhood. Mm -hmm. Or this worked for me and I turned out fine. Mm -hmm. I hear that a lot. But there are so many more things I think that parents need to consider that are different from their generation compared yes. to today's generation. Even just the foods that our children eat oh and all the gosh. things that are added to the foods. If you're not eating organic, some people say then there's a lot of those dyes and fillers and so much sugar packed and refined Absolutely. flours and all well, that. Well, you have to think of the message. If I'm sending the message that you're doing this out of fear, mm -hmm. then that's not helping that child to internalize that. Mm -hmm. And so then when you're not there to bring down the hammer or whatever you want to say, <laughs> then what's our behavior going to be like? One of my things that helped me when I was in school, I had a very strict teacher that would give demerits. And you knew when you got eight demerits that that was SWATs. Um, I grew up in the SWATing system. Um, and that, for me, was really awesome because it was like I was able to set my own boundaries. I was able to figure out, oh, I, can I probably should demerits. stop doing this. <laughs> yeah. So we, had to, so we had to take all the really good information that you all have shared. Mm -hmm. Then if we wanted to give some takeaways for today's episode, what would you all want to have viewers take away with them today? Um, I would say gather information, be informed. Mm -hmm. um, you are your child's best advocate. Mm -hmm. um, talk to people. There's no silly questions. There's no stupid questions. Um, ask. Um, seek out information. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree. And I would say communicate, communicate, communicate. I love that you said form your team mm -hmm. with the school counselor, with your pediatrician. If you have a private counselor, um, the teacher, those are all the, ad we are all advocates for that child. And so really communicating with that team and realizing that medication may be an option. It's not the only option. There are other options like diet, parenting adjustments, and, and just little routine changes, more exercise, more movement, less sugar. Those types of things can <laughs> really be extremely beneficial. So that's what I would say. And I would say that 
because right now we live in a time where there is divorces is high, I think higher than it's ever been during this time. So making sure that parents are on the best on the same page about behavior expectations, um, about rewards and consequences if kids yeah. are. Um, whether you know if they're in the same household, making sure you're on the same page, and even if you're not in the same household as parents, that you're on the same page. The consistency is so important for our children. Mm -hmm. I would also say that when you're talking to your kids, again, the eye contact, giving them one direction at a time, and then also the small goals, mm -hmm. and then the rewards and consequences, kind of reinforcing the behavior that you want to see. It's just kind of a rabbit hole. I'm sure there are many more resources mm -hmm. out there like that. So um, I actually wanted to bring up a resource, a book resource that I was thinking. Um, I recently read a book. It's called um, Last Child in the Wood, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. And it kind of goes along the lines of... Um, not medication, not medicating our children, but looking at other options. You said that, you know, we used to let our kids just go out and have a little more outdoor time. <laughs> well, um, Richard Love, I hope I'm saying his last name correctly, did a lot of research on the trends of children spending more time indoors mm -hmm. and away from nature and the increasing rates of ADHD. So mm -hmm. it's, I think it's a must read really for any parent mm -hmm. because it's just excellent. Um, the one that I brought was Parenting Children with ADHD by mm -hmm. Vincent um, Monastra. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't say his last name. Um, it's just a good, get, got some great information, some great strategies, um, some different things that you can utilize and do. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I know, my book is this, um, and this is interesting because I found a book that also has to do with the parenting styles that we talked about. You ladies are going to laugh. It's called Taking Charge of ADHD. It's the third edition, the complete authoritative uh. guide for parents. <laughs> and it's by Russell A. Barkley. And basically, it's an eight-step behavior management plan for children 6 to 18 years old with ADHD. And it helps, the book helps parents make sense of their child's symptoms, learn better parenting techniques for better behavior, um, strengthens the skills, academic and social skills. And so that's my take. I thought that I thought you'd like the authoritative. I like well, that. it's got a plan in it. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's really neat. Awesome. So when we talk about resources, um, we have lots of resources on our webpage at www.counselordynamite.com. Um, if you would like to check them out, they are specific to the Austin area. So if you live outside of this area, please check with your um, local newspaper, your chamber of commerce, um, even you know check out your local schools. Um, and you should be able to find information there. Awesome. And we love feedback, so please feel free to contact us. If you have any questions, comments, constructive feedback, um, please visit us at www.counselordynamite.com. Again, we're so happy that you're able to join us for this month's show. We hope to see you again where we will focus on the topic of anxiety. We would like for you to don't forget to subscribe for a free subscription to the Counselor Dynamite View at www.counselordynamite.com and also follow and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Until our paths cross again, we wish you good happiness, health, peace, and joy. Content of the Counselor Dynamite View, owned and operated by Life Mentors Counseling, PLLC, is intended for general information purposes only. The information, views, and opinions expressed in this online talk show are not specific medical, financial, legal, or counseling advice. The content of this video is not intended to treat, diagnose, cure, or prevent a situation or condition. Individuals with mental health concerns should consult their doctor and or mental health care provider for professional, medical advice, medications, or treatments. If you have a mental health problem, we encourage you to speak to your doctor or mental health professional immediately about your condition. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to the Counselor Dynamite View, the show hosts, or Life Mentors Counseling, PLLC, 
whose words and or opinions appear from are on this show.